You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 13, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, sublingual immunotherapy. Our presenter is Dr. Linda Cox. She's a clinical professor at Nova Southeastern University in Davie, Florida. about the third or fourth year now we've had uh, Dr. Cox talk to us about sublingual immunotherapy and if there's anybody who knows the status of it, it would be Dr. Cox and we're very pleased to have you this morning and I'm going to let you get started. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me back, Paul. Um, I always enjoy doing this. It's always been a challenge for me uh, to transition over to this uh, different mode of educating, uh, which I understand is really truly the wave of the future, uh, audio, video, tech, techno. But it's a little disheartening because I've had a couple years where it um, was a real challenge to even advance the slides, and that seems to be the case right now. Do I not have control over advancing the slides? Oh, there we go. I, I guess I have to get rid of you guys in the screen for some reason. Uh, this is my disclosure slide relevant to this particular talk as I've been a consultant. Actually, I was the principal investigator for Stallergen's uh, grass tablet phase three study that was concluded, I believe, over a year ago. And that is really all that's pertinent, except I've also been a member of the FDA Allergenic Product Advisory Committee, and this is the committee that um, would be listening to any new product applications for allergen immunotherapy. It would be going through the division of the FDA called um, CIDR, a cyber, biologic uh, and vaccines, versus the other tracks, which is CIDR for drug evaluation. So it's a little different division of the FDA that allergen extracts for the most part would be going through seeking approval. Now, originally I had planned to focus on the sublingual immunotherapy studies in progress or completed in the United States because this is an area of much interest for the practicing allergist. But Paul brought it up that a number of you are, um, are uh, new fellows and it would it would be benefit all if we began with some basics about sublingual immunotherapy. And then as a second COLA uh, in September, I would be discussing specifically the clinical trials that have been conducted or are starting uh, in the United States and status and where, where we think it might be going in terms of approval. Uh, so the focus of this particular uh, session will be a little bit of history of sublingual immunotherapy. Uh, talking a little bit about what's known and mostly what's not known about mechanisms and pharmacokinetics, um, reviewing the efficacy with a focus on the meta-analysis, uh, but also I'm going to go allergen class by allergen class because I think with sublingual immunotherapy as compared to subcutaneous immunotherapy, it's not as easy to do a one-size-fits-all when it comes to dosing. Because if you've learned so far, um, it seems that subcutaneous immunotherapy has a dosing interval that's pretty tight, somewhere in the range of 5 to 20 micrograms of the major allergen. And then talk about uh, the safety of uh, sublingual immunotherapy in general and as compared to subcutaneous immunotherapy. Now, we all know that we just celebrated our 100th year of allergen immunotherapy, crediting Noonan Friedman in England with the original pioneering studies with grass pollen. Um, they also quickly went from what they called a leisurely or we would call a conventional build-up schedule uh, to start to work with rush and accelerated schedules. Um, I'm trying to think, and they called them rush. Uh, because they recognized that allergen immunotherapy, even in the early 1900s when we weren't all so overscheduled, was not convenient. So the, the search for a more convenient and safer 
method of immunotherapy really began as shortly after we first uh, established the efficacy of subcutaneous immunotherapy. But it wasn't until uh, the mid-1980s that the clinical trials with sublingual immunotherapy began. There were earlier experiments with bronchial and oral and nasal, and at least bronchial and nasal, although there was some efficacy, there was a fair amount of side effects that made both routes kind of less attractive when sublingual immunotherapy began um, coming into the market. And I would say in this 20 plus years, there's been a um, just a huge wave of studies and they are large studies and they've been looking at a number of questions that never got really looked at or answered with subcutaneous immunotherapy or barely looked at. Things like how long is it effective after discontinuation? How long do you need to start before it is effective? Um, even, even some studies looking at multiple allergen immunotherapy, is it effective? Is it um, a lot of these questions remain quite unanswered with subcutaneous immunotherapy. So in the um, late 1980s and 1990s, there, the use of sublingual kind of exploded in some parts of the world, particularly southern Europe, where it represents 80 to 90 percent of new prescriptions for immunotherapy. But it really wasn't until 2004 that the U.S. kind of well, maybe, maybe that's not fair because I was involved, so there's a bias there. But that we really said, you know, we need to pay attention. We need to really look at this. And uh, we put together a joint task force. Uh, it started at the college meeting. And Jay Portnoy was chair of the College Immunotherapy Committee at that time. And then it, it, it went on to involve the academy, so it became a joint task force. And what we ended up doing was a very extensive systematic review that I'd say was shy of the meta-analysis because we didn't grade the evidence. But it, it, it had that kind of rigor. And we have evidence tables in the online supplementary material that covers virtually every published study up until 2005. And then if you want to go a little further and get the studies that came after that, the World Allergy Organization white position paper that was published in 2009, um, which is the reference on the bottom of this slide, will take you with evidence tables all the way through to 2009. So if you just want a comprehensive list of all the studies and the results uh, in a table format, you can merge these two documents. Um, in 2006, the first grass tablet was registered in Germany, and that was a product uh, produced by ALK, and it was a northern, uh, northern grass Timothy uh, tablet. Uh, currently, um, and for many years, there have been two companies that really represent over 50% of the immunotherapy market and thus have been really leading the way in um, clinical trials with sublingual immunotherapy, which has been the focus of their research, I'd say, for the past 10 years. Now, Data Monitor is an entity that will do a very exhaustive review of a clinical question. In uh, 06, they were, went about looking at allergic rhinitis unmet needs. And uh, at that time, they estimated that the immunotherapy sales uh, counted for about $835 million in 2006, or about 8% of the total allergic rhinitis market. And that number has been relatively flat in terms of growth for many, many, many years. But they estimate it with, the, uh, with these newer products like the brass tablet that this figure would expand and maybe even approach $1.3 billion, depending on the patient population and product price. But even back then, in 2006, when you look at sales of sublingual immunotherapy, which is this orange piece of pie versus the subcutaneous immunotherapy, which is this dark blue, we're looking at almost 50-50. That was in 06. Now, they came up with an update, uh, which was published last year. And I was one of the persons interviewed. Um, but unfortunately, you actually have to buy it. Uh, I, I was actually many years ago from given the document, which is very, it's like 600 pages, uh, 
a couple years, but to buy it, it was somewhere in the range of three or four thousand dollars. So I unfortunately don't have the most recent figures. I, I think the people that buy them are the big companies who are interested in pursuing new products, etc. So that's a little background uh, where Slit and Skit are uh, around the world. The European market still dominates immunotherapy in terms of uh, prescribing. Uh, U.S. Um, still, we only probably treat about uh, two to five percent of the eligible uh, patients in, in the U.S. or about 2.5 million patients receive immunotherapy. Now, in terms of the postulated mechanisms of sublingual immunotherapy, and this is actually a direct quote from a chapter in uh, Allergy Clinics of North America that Steve Durham and um, Guy Scatting wrote on mechanisms. And uh, it says the exact mechanisms by which Schlitt exerts its effect have yet to be resolved. But the thinking is the allergen um, is put sublingually, and then it's absorbed by these minor hand-like cells. Uh, and then taken to the local regional lymph nodes where they're processed. And then you have the, the, the effects that you would see with uh, subcutaneous immunotherapy uh, with the development of T regulatory cells and IL-10 and a shift from uh, IgE to uh, specific IgE, which may have a blocking effect or something to that effect. But um, a box in D is essentially what we think happens with subcutaneous immunotherapy. So the thought is that it's a locally absorbed process to the um, draining of uh, lymph tissue at lymph nodes and then uh, has a similar effect as subcutaneous immunotherapy with the T-rays, uh, IL-10, and uh, shift to IgG. Now, in terms of understanding specifically what happens to this allergen when it gets placed under the tongue. We really don't have a lot of pharmacokinetic data from any of the companies uh, with their lipolyzed grass tablets or even the solution studies. But early on, one of the, the landmark studies I showed you on that first slide was some work that was done with paracheria, which is a very important weed that has a long season, uh, particularly in southern uh, Europe. And so it's an important allergen. And they tagged it with radioactive iodine. And then they had the volunteers hold it underneath their tongue. I believe it was for 20 minutes. If it wasn't 20, it was 30. It was just such a long period of time, it's hard to believe. But they, they did. And, um, and, and then they tracked the radioactivity. And what they found was there was no systemic absorption until the allergen was swallowed. And then rapidly, it was, uh, they were degraded into peptides and then excreted within 1.5 to 3 hours. They found no difference um, in a, except this was one study, but in another study they compared um, the two methods that if you look at the old literature, they talk about the slit-swallow method, which is you put it underneath the tongue and then swallow, or the slit it where you put it underneath the tongue and after a short period spit it out. And the only difference they found was about 30% more of the dose um, or 30% of the dose ended up in the spat solution. And it's kind of interesting because if you track through the literature and see some of these safety studies, uh, a couple of them use a conversion to the slit fit method as a means of a dose reduction. Uh, for people who are having problems with, you know, local, um, significant local systemic reactions with immunotherapy. So with it, as with uh, subcutaneous immunotherapy, if somebody's having a lot of problems with significant large local reactions or have had systemic, we reduce the dose by reducing volume. This is a, sort of a similar concept. Um, there have been no pharmacokinetic studies with the slit tablet. And there have been no studies in humans looking at, well, I may be incorrect on that, but I think studies looking at enhancing factors like adjuvants, like CPG or, or, or MPL, have not been done with humans yet, although there's some interest in it, and there have been some mouse studies that show that if you add an, add an adjuvant to the allergen, you get better uh, systemic absorption. 
In terms of how long to keep it under the tongue, traditionally uh, from the beginning, it's been, uh, the studies have had the patients keep it under the tongue for one to two minutes. But to my knowledge, there's been no formal studies in humans that actually looked at it'd be a difficult uh, thing to study, but there has been a mouse study. And mouse studies looked at IgA levels, um, serum IgA level changes, um, and bronchial alveolar lavage fluid uh, to determine optimal duration of allergen uh, contact. And they determined that 20 seconds it provided the optimal duration of allergen contact for mice who are receiving immunotherapy. Now, I'm not sure <laughs> what the mouth to human conversion sublingual time is, but uh, again, it hasn't really been extensively studied, but uh, almost all the clinical trials have used one, to, pretty much have used two minutes under the tongue. And lastly, in talking about uh, genetics and um, uh, absorption. I'm just going to mention this study, and this is an area of interest and, and maybe study further, but um, this was a study that looked at cadavers and found that there are in the mouth different uh, amounts of mast cells and Langer hand cells in different parts of the sublingual um, architecture. And what they found was uh, the highest density of mast cells was in the gingiva and the lowest in the palatum and lingua. And um, the mast cells located within the lobe and duct of the salivary glands, they speculated, may be the cause of some of the local reactions that you see with sublingual immunotherapy. Whereas the Langerhans cells, which would be the good guys, the highest density of those would be within the vestibular region and the lowest in the sublingual region. So they kind of were throwing out the idea what maybe location matters in terms of where you're putting these drops or tablets. But this is something that still, I think, needs to be explored. I do remember reviewing, I do believe it was published, a study that looked at superlingual versus sublingual, and I believe the clinical benefits in terms of clinical outcomes, like symptom scores, were similar. Um, but that's a hazy memory. But I, I think there was one study that might have looked at that. It wasn't double blind, uh, I don't believe. So these are some interesting concepts that need more work. But there is some suggestion that where you put the allergen within the mouth may make a difference in terms of side effects and also efficacy. Do you have any questions so far about this kind of background information about sublingual um, immunotherapy? Well, I try to put you back on, but I'm afraid I might. <laughs> OK, well, then I'll move on to efficacy. Uh, everybody's still there, right? Good we here. <laughs> OK. I just wish I could put you up and not. Uh... Here you are. OK. Let me see if I can advance with you being right there. I don't know why it didn't advance before. This slide I use in most of my presentations, this is the comparison of the meta-analysis, Cochrane meta-analysis, done basically by the same group. Moises Calderon and Wilson are both part of the group in the United Kingdom who work with Stephen Durham. And uh, the first sublingual immunotherapy Cochrane review came out in 2005, and the very first Cochrane meta-analysis for subcutaneous immunotherapy came out in actually two years later. Surprising, there were other meta-analysis, but not a Cochrane meta-analysis. Now, the magnitude of difference when you look at symptoms uh, for Medicaid, for SLIT and SKIT, you can see that there is a great greater magnitude. 0.73 is in the range of a high moderate to high effect, whereas 0.42 is sort of moderate effect. And standardized mean differences is the difference between the means of both treatment arms divided by the pool standard deviation. Now with medications, you can see that it's pretty similar for both split and skit. Now what's, now I, I got to get rid of you guys because it won't let me advance. No. But when, um, when you look at how many studies these are based on, remember SLIT um, has not been 
uh, in use uh, starting in the late 80s, anywhere near as long as SCIP. But uh, there were 22 studies included in that meta-analysis, and 21 uh, were felt to provide sufficient symptom score data. Whereas at SCIT, over a much longer period of time, had over 1,000 studies, but only, met, only 15 met uh, the criteria uh, to analyze symptom scores. And the, when you looked at the studies that were actually analyzed, uh, the patient number for the two treatment were very similar in the 500-ish uh, range. And of course, more time has gone on, and there have been many, many more SLIT studies. And these studies are including patient populations of 450, 600 patients. And we just haven't really seen many subcutaneous immunotherapy studies of that magnitude. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure we will. With our currently available extracts, I think people are looking for a novel, more convenient, uh, more convenient being either patient can do it at home or it's only a few steps, like three or four injections. Anyway, that's, that's an opinion. Um, this is the latest Cochrane meta-analysis for sublingual immunotherapy. Uh, Susan Radulovic is also part of the group that works with Steve Durham. Um, now, you can see, if you look at all studies, they were, they were up to 49 trials that provided uh, enough data. Um, you see the magnitude still in that medium range of 0.49 for the symptoms. But when you took the study, so it went beyond 12 months, now you're getting at a magnitude of effect that's getting close to subcutaneous immunotherapy, 0.7. And this is looking at the, um, the um, two most recent uh, meta-analysis. This is a, a table Dana Wallace put together for a paper that we had written for the uh, immune, immune, immunology clinics of North America. And um, when you're looking at symptoms, slit versus skit, you're still seeing a greater magnitude, but they're catching up. And in this particular comparison, the medication scores were um, were uh, quite a bit different for the uh, SCIT versus the uh, SLIT study. Um, and this is looking at two uh, meta-analysis. The Calimetra study is not a Cochrane meta-analysis, if I recall. And the Ibrison is the most recent uh, Cochrane data meta-analysis. Uh, it's the third update, I believe. Uh, that's coming from this group for asthma, and each have shown very favorable uh, benefits of subcutaneous immunotherapy with, uh, for asthma. This is for asthma. What I was showing you previously was for, um, for allergic rhinitis. So you can see both uh, sublingual and subcutaneous immunotherapy meta-analysis have favored uh, the benefits of uh, immunotherapy for both types and asthma and allergic rhinitis. And just recently there was a meta-analysis, a Cochrane database, a meta-analysis for the use of sublingual immunotherapy in the treatment of allergic rhinitis. And as you can see, the magnitude of the effect uh, with an SMB of being 0 0.3, 0 0.4 is not as strong as what you saw for allergic rhinitis. Although I would have to just add that when you look at clinical trials for allergic rhinitis, the symptom parameter is usually a total rhinitis conjunctivitis score where they, there's usually four nasal symptoms and two, two eye symptoms blended together into a score. So often the eye symptoms are buried into. But I suspect in these studies they, they look, actually I'm not completely sure if these were completely studies that only looked at eye. I think they would look, try to tease out the eye changes in some of the allergic rhinitis studies. Now, to give you some comparison, um, and this was a slide presented or uh, loaned to me by Stephen Durham, and also uh, from a presentation he gave in an FDA advisory committee meeting. But this gives you some perspective on how does, how do the slip and skip studies compare in terms of the uh, standardized mean difference with uh, other standard treatment for allergic rhinitis. So you can see the magnitude here is, um, uh, for mimetazone is similar to sublingual immunotherapy. Uh, and then 
uh, in terms of how much improvement, how much of a percentage, because people ask how much improvement is considered clinically significant. I'm not sure we know the answer to that, but the World Allergy Organization has a published paper with recommendations on conducting clinical trials for immunotherapy. And their recommendation is that a significant improvement should be 20% over placebo of the combined medication symptom scores. This is just to give you some perspective of how SLIT and SKIT compared to uh, two, two types of SLIT. Um, studies, these are both uh, tablet studies, compared to um, a subcutaneous uh, clinical trial using about the same dose, except the SKIT dose is administered monthly as an injection, and the SLIT doses are daily. And what you can see as you're running in these, all of these were large-scale studies, 400 some patients, you're looking at about a 30 percent or a little more over placebo improvement. How does that compare, again, with other conventional treatments for rhinitis? And again, this was from Steve Durham, but these numbers are actually from package inserts, uh, the clinical trials that were uh, put into the package inserts. And you're seeing, for instance, for nasal steroids, the magnitude of effect over placebo is in the range of 16 to 18 percent. And then antihistamine, that's loratadine, 8 percent. And I heard from a menazone, similar, kind of 8 percent. So when you look at immunotherapy, even though, you know, 20, 30 percent doesn't sound like this huge magnitude of improvement compared to our other um, treatment uh, interventions, it's actually better. Um, but I think we have to keep in mind a couple things. One is with Immunotherapy clinical trials, symptom scores are taken over an entire season, A. B, patients are allowed rescue medications. And they're allowed this because it's felt unethical to make them go through a whole season without um, any rescue medication. Whereas most of these allergic rhinitis medication clinical trials are very short, two-week studies, and they are not allowed to take rescue medication. So the use of rescue medications, uh, when you look at symptom scores, is going to make a symptom score maybe look not as bad. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you're allowed to take a medication, maybe you don't get as bad as you would have, so your the magnitude of difference between you and the placebo group may not be as significant. Now, way back when, there was an old study, and um, a subcutaneous study that compared, uh, that got about an uh, improvement range of in the high 60s. But it was a very selective patient population that were defined as being very highly sensitive based on skin test reactivity and some other parameters. So if you start to tease out some of these large studies, and they are starting to do it, I know the Salergen study looked at the highest tertile. They, they divided the groups into three, and the groups that walked in there with the highest amount of symptoms also had the greatest magnitude of improvement. Now, that's not like that's not, that shouldn't be greatly surprising, but you just have to keep in mind these are very large studies, four or five hundred patients, so you're going to have a, a kind of a continuum of symptom severity. So, if you tease out certain groups, like your more severe group, you might might be seeing much more dramatic improvement in terms of magnitude of reduction in symptoms. So does everybody agree or disagree you want it to be? <laughs> All right. Um, some of the pitfalls of the sublingual immunotherapy trials, particularly in the beginning in those papers that we reviewed for that first uh, Academy College joint uh, effort, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of design and interpretation. Um, in terms of, I mean, design being one study would be allergen given once a week, every third day, um, uh, and start it two weeks before season, you know, start it four months before. Uh, so there was a lot of heterogeneity, and it was difficult to uh, interpret. But as time has gone on, and since the World Allergy documents come out, I think these studies are getting very 
similar in design and in terms of how outcomes are being looked at. So I think that problem is starting to go away. There still is a problem in that um, there is at least the older studies, um, a lot of them have their own proprietary units. It's virtually impossible to understand how much allergen is really being given. And these units are often based on skin testing uh, comparison between um, a patient, a reference group, or comparison with uh, histamine, titrated skin testing. And if um, an allergen produces the same wheel as a histamine, then it might get the label of 100 IR. So there's a little problem with uh, the use of these proprietary units. But more and more, again, we're seeing studies reporting the estimated major allergen content in a study uh, paper. The other thing to consider is there's no true placebo with sublingual immunotherapy. You, um, you can't put histamine underneath the tongue. It doesn't make the same. It doesn't make them itch, and it doesn't give them the same effects as allergen underneath the tongue. So the issue in question is, do these people who are getting active treatment, and a fair percentage of them do get uh, symptoms, uh, is that affecting their perception of improvement? And a lot of studies, uh, again, the earlier studies, the concealment of treatment allotment information is not provided. And this is uh, that paper I made early reference to. Uh, we actually uh, wrote our first draft in Aspen, not because we're a bunch of jet setters and, you know, we were living the light, but <laughs> uh, the man, Hal Nelson, said this is where we're going to meet and write our first, um, uh, our first draft. And this is Desiree Lorena, uh, third chair of the County's Immunotherapy Committee, and this is Andre Knopfy, and since then he went uh, and crossed over to industry. But what we found in this first review, and again, it, it was a lot of these small studies with um, kind of uh, trying to feel out what would be the best dose, dosing regimen. We found about 38% did not meet primary outcome in either symptom or medication scores in the first year, um, and about 30% um, met efficacy in both um, outcomes. However, if you track them out into year two, some of them uh, then uh, demonstrated efficacy in either symptom, medication, or both. Um, so uh, questions that we raise, and I think some of these still stand, uh, particularly the first one, and, and is, that is, is the optimal dosing range the same for all classes of allergen? In other words, it's the same for dust mite as for grass as for ragweed. And what's the optimal schedule? And I think that still probably needs a little working out. Most of the studies now are doing daily regimens. Um, not so much, I think, that they think it has to be daily to be effective, but I think um, there's a concern that that uh, be less compliant if you had to do something a couple times a week. And this is the uh, WOW position paper that I think has the, is the most complete review of the subject to date, um, and in that, uh, composite. Uh, there were uh, 48 trials in the 60 that were included that showed overall positive results, but there were still 12 that were totally or almost totally negative. And uh, the conclusion was the meta-analysis have been in favor of FLIT, but there is still great heterogeneity, and uh, but FLIT overall is felt to be effective. Um, and what else was included in this paper was that really the data is probably strongest for grass. That's where we see those uh, big uh, clinical trials have been done with four to 600 patients. They've been done with grass, uh, grass pollen. Those have been sort of the, the ground breakers. But um, there have been other allergens. So for the next section, I'm going to actually go allergen by allergen and what we know and, and don't know. Um, as I mentioned from the data monitor report, ALK and allergens are the leaders and continue to be in terms of the research uh, and clinical trials. And the focus of their research has been tablets. And uh, the groundbreaking, I'd say, landmark paper uh, that really put SLIT on the map was a study that looked at three doses of grass tablet. The uh, proprietary units are S. QT, but we were provided with a major allergen content in terms of Timothy group uh, flea P5, and that at three doses looked at were 0.55 and 15 daily. 
and they tried to um, it was they tried to start at least eight weeks before season, but there was some variability in how much preseasonal treatment each patient had. So when they looked at the total groups, you can see the first two doses did not meet any uh, significance in terms of p-value, but the 15 microgram group did start to show some uh, significant change in medication and almost in symptoms. But um, what you needed to do was tease out the group who had at least eight weeks of treatment, eight weeks of preseasonal treatment, and now you achieve or you reach a primary outcome in terms of the 21% reduction in symptom scores. So what this paper did was demonstrate a dose response in terms of sublingual immunotherapy, and it also suggests that there may be a need for a certain amount of preseason exposure to get first, first season efficacy. This is a very um, nice series of studies that came out of um, this original work, um, uh, they decided to focus on the 15 microgram dose, then um, went on to do a three-year clinical trial and looked at symptoms and medications through the three years, and then stopped treatment. And now they have been following these patients for two years post uh, discontinuation of treatment. So that what this is doing is trying to answer the question of duration of immunotherapy, which there is a paucity of literature in the subcutaneous um, field. Uh, the four-year data, the one-year post-treatment was published last year, and uh, the fifth year was published just a month or so ago. And you're looking at it right here, so you can see year one, you have about a 32% reduction in total symptom scores uh, going down to 44 and 37. Discontinuation, really no loss at 31% and the same at year five. So this is telling us or suggesting three years of continuous treatment because this protocol is continuous treatment. And when they went to do their subsequent studies after that first study, they, were, they started four months before season. So this is um, three years of continuous treatment. Seems to provide at least two years of clinical efficacy after discontinuation. I don't have it as part of this slide deck, but they also looked at the immunologic parameters that they look at in these clinical trials, the specific IgG4. There is an assay Dr. Dur uh, Professor Durham's developed called the, um, it's now the IgE blocking assay. It's something in the serum of immunotherapy patients that appears to uh, block allergen um, presentation. And uh, neither IgG4 or this blocking effect has a significant change after discontinuation of therapy. In other words, you seem to still have that benefit immunologically that was seen in, um, in, uh, during treatment. This is the dose response study of the other company, Stellagen's product. It's a similar concept. It's a lyophilized tablet. Uh, their unit is IR, which stands for I think internal reference, I might be wrong on the I, I'm blocking. Um, the content of their 300 IR is approximately 25 micrograms of PLEA-P5, but it is a mixture of five grasses, and they're all in the northern grass family. So it's, um, the, the combined PLEA-P5 um, is 25 micrograms. It's felt that these five northern grasses have slightly different epitopes in terms of the major allergen. And there is some benefit to offering this mixture of PLEA-P5 and PLEA-P1 epitopes. Um, they demonstrated starting four months before season in the middle of um, uh, peak pollen season, there were significant differences of in the range of 37% uh, in the two treatment groups, 300 and 500 R. IR, but the 100 IR group had no clinical efficacy, same as placebo. So again, we saw a nice dose response four months before treatment. What they subsequently went on to do, this is similar in the previous study that I presented with uh, the uh, Steve Durham's work, is they wanted to look at duration. So this is a duration of treatment study, but and they also looked at a different dosing concept. So this is a concept of starting treatment two months versus four months. So that's what these two columns are. 
before season, during season, stop. Next year, same thing, two months, four months, during, it's, they, it's referred to as interrupted season, interrupted treatment. Um, I think that's one of the terms that's been used for it. But it's pre-co-seasonal, stop pre-co-seasonal. And um, you can recognize that if this is effective, even, even if it was four months and co-seasonal, um, but you still stop for a number of months, um, there, there are some cost uh, benefits to being able to have the shorter treatment course. So what they were looking at is two months versus four months before season. And what they found was um, season one, the lighter green, interestingly, is the um, two months before versus the um, four months before. You could see you had a significant benefit. And then by year two and three, the um, clinical benefits of the two versus four months were, were virtually identical. And then they stopped, and now they're looking at um, clinical benefits a year later, and um, they are still sustained. I believe they have their... Uh, uh, two-year post-discontinuation data that I believe was presented recently, and that continues to look as good as it did during treatment. So now we have two studies that have shown that grass tablet therapy for three months, three years, um, can provide clinical benefits that is sustained um, for at least two years post-discontinuation. Another study that looked or attempted to look at duration of efficacy is very complicated because a lot of it was looking backwards um, at a patient population that received uh, either three, four, or five years of sublingual or just pharmacotherapy. And they wanted to see how long the benefits of the um, sublingual immunotherapy lasted after discontinuation. And the conclusion was that if you received SLIP for four or five years, your clinical benefits lasted at least eight years. So the conclusion was four year, four year is better than, um, four was better than five for that reason. You got the same duration of efficacy. Um, so that it's a little complicated, it, again, because it was looking at patients more backwards. It wasn't really prospective. But they're all combined, uh, what I've told you is it looks like about three to four years um, is probably going to provide some sustained clinical benefits, maybe indefinite, in the patient population. And more and more, particularly in the United States, as we're dealing with health care reform and, and these issues where uh, people want to know how much, how long, um, we're starting to get answers for that. Now, this is, is an interesting study because it, it it's looking at another question, and that's onset of efficacy. Now, I showed you a two versus four month study, and it suggested two months um, may be sufficient before season. Uh, this was a little different in how they looked at efficacy. This was the uh, Celerogen grass tablet product, the 300 IR. And they looked at patients out of season, and they looked at them in an environmental chamber challenge model. So what they found is that day seven, the placebo versus the 300 IR group started to split up in terms of efficacy. And at one month, it was uh, significant. So there are, at one month, at least in an environmental chamber challenge, which one would argue is a lot more exposure, you're already seeing clinical benefits, protective benefits of um, the sublingual immunotherapy. And this was... Um, the same product studied a little differently, and, and I might even argue it's got a little real-world uh, part to it, uh, a little real-world uh, flavor to it. it. It starts people in the very beginning of grass season using an ultra-rush titration. Um, and um, basically, they're at maintenance in 20 minutes. so. Most of the recent studies there really doesn't appear to be a need for an updosing, but this is how this study was designed. So what they found was with combined symptom medication scores, there was progressive improvement beginning with season one. Um, the symptom scores, there's actually a pretty significant difference in season one. Uh, medication scores never really 
uh, achieved significance through the three years. But this was a study where they started them in the beginning of grass season, literally in the beginning of grass season. So it may be that this treatment uh, could be started uh, close to the beginning of season. Now, the best status so far that I've shown you, I think two months is something that you, you could hang your hat on. But this study suggests that maybe even early into season you could begin treatment and, and achieve some efficacy. Um, this is the clinical trial that I um, mentioned earlier in my disclosure that I uh, was the principal investigator. And these are the five graphs that are part of that 300 IR tablet. And um, this was a large study, 473 uh, patients um, in 51 centers. And one of the things I just wanted to point out um, in these patient populations, and this study's not unique, they had symptoms for a long time. These aren't like kids just starting to have a fibrinitis. They have 22-year duration of treatment. So I just wanted to uh, bring that out. And also that the majority of patients in this study and in a number of the other clinical trials were polysensitized, 79%. That means they had other allergens. They, they had to be excluded if they had a relevant allergen like the heograft or Bermuda, or they were actively symptomatic to an, um, an overlapping tree season or a season that was very close. But one of the things I think is interesting about this study and why I'm bringing it up, and um, hopefully this will be published sometime in the near future, is we we practice, or we, the inclusion criteria was as we do in the United States. We just prick skin tests, we take history in that setting. In Europe, uh, they require, for the most part, that they be skin test positive and specific IgE positive. We, we kind of debated and struggled with that, and the US debaters won. But there was actually a fair number of patients, not, not a, a large number, 67, that had no specific IgE to grasp. And when we looked at those patients, they also had no symptoms during the grass season and had no difference in terms of the placebo or the treatment group, but they also had no symptoms. Um, and the message that I think we will put in that paper is that at least for clinical trials, uh, the use of specific IgE as well as skin test reactivity should be considered in patient conclusion, I mean inclusion. I know Brock, if he's, I know he's there, I know he's been interested in this and has found that with some of the studies you, you've worked on, correct? We'll unmute him just a second. Um, Brock, are you there? Yeah, that's correct, Linda. Uh, we certainly found that out with uh, subcutaneous. Okay, so I, again, these patients, by definition, would have had a positive prick skin test to Timothy of at least five millimeters, but they weren't required to have IgE. This was just a secondary exploratory marker we looked at. And that group did not show, the ones that did not have specific IgE to Timothy also had no symptoms or no difference between the placebo or 300 IR groups, but they also didn't get symptoms during season. So, mm -hmm. interesting finding. Um, this is just some background, uh, older studies that looked at solutions. What I presented so far has been all tablet studies. And the solution studies uh, really uh, found uh, mixed results in terms of what dosing you might recommend. There was a, a study of 30 micrograms daily versus placebo, and there was no significant difference in primary outcomes, symptoms, or medications. And a similar effect with the uh, use of nine micrograms, um, it was only found to be effective in a subgroup analysis of the more severe group. And this has actually been the case with several other studies with different allergens. It required a subgroup analysis to see clinical benefits. Thus, might the efficacy in the literature is huge range from somewhere in the ballpark of 15 micrograms to 700 micrograms a month. So if you were to just say, I'm going to take what I have in my shelf and start administering dust mite, um, I wouldn't know what dose to advise. Um, I, it would be shooting in the dark. Um, but a meta-analysis of the trials to date were favorable in terms of um, uh, showing efficacy of dust mite for respiratory allergy. But you can see there's a pretty um, 
pretty uh, large confidence interval. Um, and the group felt that the, there's a need for um, more studies, um, more uh, more studies to help define what an effective dose for dust mite immunotherapy. Um, there is a, a work being done with both uh, both big watch companies that I mentioned with a graph. Uh, let me just mention that CAT, uh, there's only been a few studies with CAT, and one showed efficacy, one did not, and the dosing range between the effective and not effective uh, was huge. Uh, so again, CAT dosing is really not clear. There is a company in the U.S. I think is interested in studying it using the environmental chamber challenge, but we still, you know, we still need more guidelines on what dose would be effective for CAT, and I don't believe dogs didn't study. There's been, the two big companies are looking at dust mite tablets, and this is um, one of them. And this was a year study, and they looked at uh, those that 500 versus 300 IR dosing. And this was for allergic rhinitis, and they did show significant uh, differences. I would just look at the percentages, not, not of the magnitude you saw with color, but dust mite's a little tougher allergen um, because it's not, don't have that intense seasonal exposure. But what's interesting about this study is they treated them for a year, and then they followed them for a year without treatment, and they seem to have continued clinical benefit. These are the two treatment groups for 20 months, and then you lost, and then it started to wear off. So it's interesting. Um, this might suggest that if you treat, you probably need to treat for more than one, one year for dust mites. And there's work, ongoing work planned for dust mite tablets, I believe, even to be started in the United States. This is a study about CAT. I mentioned the study that showed efficacy, and they both used uh, CAT challenge chambers as the, end, as the, um, the primary outcome. Uh, and the first was the Hal Nelson study using roughly about 40 micrograms of the liquid solution for about 105 days. And then the other used, according to the study, 0.05 micrograms of LV1 daily. And the lower dose one shows a clinical efficacy used in the chamber challenge, whereas um, uh, Dr. Nelson's group did not show a difference in the placebo versus the uh, treatment group. And of note, in Nelson's study, the dose was 2.3 times the cumulative yearly dose of the, of the effective low dose study, the daily dose. So, I mean, it's a little confusing. That's why we need good studies to help us define what would be effective dosing in some of these allergens. And I only have about five minutes left, correct? That's good. Okay. Uh, Ragweed, um, uh, two earlier published papers, same company, um, using the IR product, uh, found that there was efficacy, uh, but it was a, sort of a post hoc analysis in the people who could tolerate up to 300 IR. They found a clinical um, effectiveness, so it was a subgroup analysis. And then another Canadian study using a solution uh, with the same product. But they started uh, treatment uh, July 16th to July 30th, so probably too soon before season started. But they only found efficacy if they eliminated one of their sites, and then it was only in two nasal symptoms, paritis and sneezing. Now, there's been several graph uh, studies that have been conducted in Europe and uh, United States. Uh, uh, AOK's product in the United States Merck is uh, studying it. Um, it's looking at three doses, one, six, and 12 micrograms. And it has been, been presented as a poster uh, at the latest Academy meeting, and I'm sure at EAC meeting. And it looks like the 12 and 6 look promising. The 1 is probably not going to be effective. But I think that's the doses that they're going to be exploring. Those are tablets. There have been a number of, there's actually been a couple studies with Greer um, looking at solution slip. The first study compared uh, 48 versus uh, 4.8, uh, and they did only see uh, significant improvement in a group with post hoc, and, a post hoc analysis teasing out the group that had the most severe symptoms. They saw a significant improvement in the 48 microgram group. But we're just released as a press release um, their latest phase three study looking at 40, up to 42 micrograms of AMD1 for minimum of eight weeks before treatment. 
and then so pre and post seasonal. And what they found, this isn't a press release, it's not in abstracts or presentations yet, but it, they did release it. But they found a 43% reduction in total combined symptom and medication scores, which is the biggest improvement I think I've shown you to date, um, and that no uh, significant safety issues other than the most common uh, local, local reactions and most common side effects. So that sounds exciting. That is a, a solution study. Uh, and, and Greer would be applying for a new indication for an existing product. There's some work being done with cockroach, it's my understanding, and they're roughly going for a dose of about five micrograms. Uh, they're looking at solution and uh, uh, cockroach and also subcutaneous. And it's my understanding one of the problems they're seeing is they're really not seeing big immunologic changes. So questioning whether they're getting a systemic effect with sublingual cockroach. So I'm going to skip through that if I am running out of time. But there is work being done with cockroach. There have been a few studies with Alchinaria in Europe. They, they use relatively low doses, about 1.25 micrograms for all day one. But the subcutaneous injection dose that showed efficacy was not high either. It was about two. And, and they did show improvement in these studies compared with placebo, looking at the usual outcome markers, symptoms, medication. And I'm just going to skip through um, all of this and just uh, go to Hal Nelson's multi-allergen study. Um, this was done uh, to question whether um, a practice pattern, which I think is not infrequently used, at least in this in U.S. with slit, where we uh, combine multiple allergens. Uh, so he compared a single allergen, Timothy, versus multiple allergens um, using the same dose of Timothy. Um, and then he looked at the number of outcomes. Unfortunately, the year he was looking at outcomes was dry year for uh, Denver, so they had a record low grass pollen count. So neither treatment group had any bump in symptom or medication scores, but all the uh, surrogate markers for efficacy, the IgG, the titrated skin testing, the nasal challenge, showed significant difference in the single allergen Timothy alone group versus the multi-allergen plus Timothy. With the exception of the skin test, there was some change, but the magnitude was not as great as it was with um, the single allergen. So this particular study raises some question about putting a bunch of allergen together, dropping it under the tongue. And I will confess that we have similar questions about subcutaneous immunotherapy. But remember, sublingually, we're only keeping it there for a very short while, swallowing it, and then it's being excreted, whereas when it, it's injected, it's kind of there. So I think um, I will just make one comment about safety, and that is the majority of, of sublingual immunotherapies are oral mucosal, mouth, most of them occur within the first one to two weeks of treatment, and then they seem to go away. Rarely there are systemic reactions that occur. This is uh, that GRASS tablet study, the three-year study that I showed earlier that was pre- and co-seasonal and then stopped. And one of the things that they observed, you would worry that maybe year two you start having more side effects in the beginning of treatment. But what they found actually as they went through these three years of pre- and co-season, the side effects actually decreased. So by the third year, they had less of the side effects. And that is where I think I'm going to end. On time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Linda. I um, didn't let you. I didn't let any of you speak, and that's terrible. But <laughs> no, we have we have a, a couple minutes for questions. Does anybody in the uh, group have a question for Linda? Oh, where are you guys? Well, I, um, I have a, question, um, a kind of a practical question. When you know people, you talk about people having these oral reactions. Do you, uh, do you typically, when you're doing your study, do you typically pre-treat them with, you know, some sort of antihistamine that they're taking while they're on the slit, um, or do you, when they have, their, they take their 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 dose and then they start having itching of their mouth, they take a dose of an antihistamine then, um, and um, um, you know, and how often by just taking, uh, I guess, a rescue antihistamine, would that get, would the symptoms go away, or or how often do they they feel more concerned about that and want to do something else? Oh, 
Um, it's my, well, no, uh, antihistamine pretreatment has, to my knowledge, not been part of any of the protocols nor recommended by the Europeans. It's my understanding it's not effect, it, it is not effective in preventing these oral mucosal reactions. And I what about treating don't them? know how that. I don't think it is, but I'm not sure. It, it that is anecdotal. Okay. No, I'm just, I, just, I don't believe that's ever been formally studied. I mean, the feeling is these are you know you kind of tough, tough it out, or um, <laughs> but um, there have been very bad case reports of really significant local reactions that lasted a couple of days, and of course you're going to be treating those with antihistamine and maybe even steroids. The case reports where they had, you know, significant lip swelling and tongue swelling that lasted several days, and but these are pretty uncommon. Yeah. I was just thinking if, if See, a couple other things about um, uh, kind of the safety. You know, the guidelines or the instructions for patients in terms of what to do and not to do. I don't think has been clearly mapped out the way we have like practice parameters, but the. Some of the guidelines from the European uh, publications suggest that you don't give it when they and someone has gastroenteritis. Uh, you don't uh, if there's a mouth event going on, ulcerations, infections. There's concern that that may rapidly absorb the allergen if there's open ulcerations. So there are these kind of guidelines uh, out there: gastroenteritis. Um, the, even the European uh, uh, guidelines for immunotherapy listed increased asthma symptoms as a sign not to give um, mm -hmm. sublingual, but that kind of makes sense. And okay. gaps in treatment, that's the other question, gaps in treatment. Um, how, how long can they go for getting their dose before you tell them that they need to do something? And that's not clear, clearly defined. I, I think if you kind of question some of the experts, they, they might say a couple days and then they need to come in, but I, I don't know that we know the answer to that, to be honest with you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your, um, the talk this morning. Um, we're looking forward to your talk in September um, when we can have some more information about SLIT. Um, and um, uh, if Dr. Gross is online, which I guess he is, we're going to take a couple minute break here and we'll get Dr. Gross's slides up and ready and we'll um, resume here in a couple minutes with Dr. Gary Gross. Thanks, thanks again, Linda. Have a good weekend. Okay, you too. Bye. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. next time.